Hello, I'm Kathy Davidson, and I'd like you to join me as I minister the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You know why? Because that's where the power is at. Amen? Let's open with prayer. My Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we can see. Open our ears that we can hear. Open our hearts like you did for Lydia, that we can attend unto the things which are spoken. Turn us from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto you. And Father, I ask for a spirit of grace on this message, a spirit of grace. And let us only see Jesus. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a girlfriend who was having a reoccurring infection in her body, very uncomfortable. I have heard it in a lot of women. And one day during praise, the God told me. Pray for her and break the power of that curse. So I went to her after the service. It wasn't right during it. And I asked if she would mind if I prayed for her in my office. She and her husband came. He prayed with me. But I broke the power of that curse over her body in the name of Jesus. And you know what? Within hours, she was totally healed. Totally healed. Why? That is the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus came. That the power would work in us just like it worked in him when he walked on this earth. I want you to go with me to Mark 1, 14 and 15. Let's take a look again. Again, do you have this verse memorized yet? I hope so. It says, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and say, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The time is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And how do we get that kingdom? Again, how do we get the kingdom of God? Jesus tells us right here with this instruction, repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye to get the kingdom. And we know the kingdom is with power. It's not just in word, it's in power. We know the kingdom is in us. And we know the father wants us to have the kingdom and jesus gives us the instruction again over and over right here how to get that kingdom he said repent repent you change what you're thinking change the way you're thinking change your will and do what believe the gospel believe the gospel trust in adhere to commit to the gospel and we know that in 1 Corinthians 15 is the definition, the bona fide definition of that gospel. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. That is your gospel. That is what we put our trust in, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. In those small sentences, in those words, is the answer to every one of the problems that you will ever have. Do you hear me? In those words that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures, is the answer to every problem you will ever have. How can that be? But Jesus accomplished on the cross for you and me. And it was the Father that put him there. And the Father sent him to the cross out of love for us, out of love for you. Jesus went to the cross because the Father loved you. And I want to show us today a situation. I want us to show you through a, a story that's in the Bible, through a happening of King David, that'll help illustrate what happened with Jesus on the cross. If you will turn with me to 2 Samuel verse chapter 21, I'm going to read this account that David had in when he was king of Israel. It's not an easy account to think. It's not an easy account to listen to. It's tough, but in it, I want to show you, I want to show you, it's a beautiful illustration. 
what was going to happen in the future, Jesus on the cross. It says in verse 1, there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. When David inquired of the Lord, a famine, a three-year famine, no food. And you know what? David was king. And so David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And a king called the Gibeonites, King David. And said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his seal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, He said, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement? There was sin in the land that Saul had committed. And there was famine because of that sin. Famine, listen, because of the sin that Saul had committed. So David went to them and he said, what shall and wherewith shall I make the atonement, the appeasement? Where shall I pay for this sin that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeon said unto him, we will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us, us, neither for us shall thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What shall I say that I will I do for you? And they answered the king in verse 5: The king that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel. This is this is what they require. Verse 6: Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us seven of his children, Saul's children of his sons, and we will hang them up in, uh, unto the Lord in Gibba of Saul, whom the Lord doth choose. And the king said, I will give them. Do you notice here, David, to break the famine said, I'll give you seven sons of Saul that you can hang them. Another version uses the word impale. Seven, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. The, sing, the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ahab, whom she bare unto Saul, Amani and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Berzeliah, the Mahathalite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And look what they did to those seven sons. They hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of the harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven. And suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David that Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Gabesh Dilagad, which had stolen them from the street of Bashan, where the Philistines had hanged them, and where the Philistines had slain Saul in Geboah. And he brought up thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son. And they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, buried they in the country of Benjamin of Zela, in the sepulcher of Kish, his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And look what happened after those seven men were killed and hanged. The other versions say impaled seven sons of Saul to pay for the sin that Saul had committed. Who required that? Jehovah required that of David to rid the land of the, to rid the land of the famine. God required David to hang those seven men and pale them to pay for the sin 
And look what happened in the last sentence of that passage. It says, and after that, after those seven men were impaled, after they were hung, after they were killed, God was entreated for the land. And when God was entreated, the famine ended. The famine ended. That is not an easy story to read. You know, if you know, Michael was at one time married to David, but then she was taken from David and she was given to another man. All the children that Michael had by the other man were part of this group that were killed. You know, it is not good to come against God's anointed. It is not. Now, I want you to see that what happened with those men, God required that they be killed for the famine. And God was entreated and the famine ended. The same thing, the same type of punishment was given to free us of our sin, to free us of our curses, to free us from all the sins that we had committed against God. If you will turn with me to Romans 3, I'm going to begin in verse 21. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law was manifested. The righteousness of God, being right in God's eyes. That's what righteousness could be. It's one of the definitions. It says, but now the righteousness of God, without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It says, even the righteousness of God, being right in God's eyes, all sins forgiven, justified. It says, even being right in God's eyes, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, unto all, unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus died for every person in this world, every person that was and every person that is now. Jesus was put on the cross for. There is none that are left out. For verse 23, for all have sinned. All have sinned. There is no man that is without sin. We got that sin from Adam. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no man without sin. Word of God cannot be broken. And it says right here, all have sinned. All have sinned. If you are one of those that says, I have never sinned, you need to go read in 1 John, where it says that if you say you have no sin, that makes you a liar. And guess what? Lying's a sin. So welcome to the club. We all have sinned. No man is without sin. But, but, but there is hope. There is a way out. The next verse, 24, being justified freely. Justified. Taking all the sin away. Not only taking the sin away from you, but taking it out of your conscience. Where you don't even think about it anymore. Did you know there was such a thing? Did you know that there is such a thing that God is able not only to forgive the sin, not only to forgive you, but to take it out of your conscience where it doesn't bother you any. There are so many of us that have sins that bother us day and night, that we ask God to forgive a hundred times. He has forgiven it. He will forgive when you ask. And not only will he forgive, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, he will take it out of your conscience when you believe, when you trust in, when you commit to that gospel, he will take the sin out of your conscience. You won't even think about it anymore. It won't be there. Now, it says being 
justified freely by his grace, by his grace. You know what grace is? Grace. You didn't ask for it. You don't deserve it. But God does it anyway. I'll say that again. You didn't ask for it. You didn't ask for God to do this. You don't deserve what God did for this. In fact, you don't even want what Jesus did. But he did it anyway. He did it anyway. You don't deserve it. He did it anyway. You didn't ask for him to die for you, but he did it anyway. That's grace. That's grace. He did it anyway. He bore your sin anyway. He paid for it anyway. He went to hell for it anyway. That's grace. That's grace. It says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption. Through the redemption. That word redemption was a big word for me when I was younger. Redemption, it just means the ransom paid in full. The ransom paid in full. I have a good illustration of this. I put myself through college being a waitress. And I remember a couple came in and they were having a hard day, a hard day. In fact, that they, they were away from home and things were happening and, and they had to deal with problems and situations in the family. And they came in and they sat at one of my tables and they kind of explained to me what a hard day was. And then they ordered their dinner. And at the end of their dinner, they had a, a nice dinner. They ordered what they wanted. And at the end of dinner, I came over and when they asked me for the check, I said, it's been paid for. You don't owe me anything. Your dinner has been paid for, paid in full. You don't owe me anything. You know what? That's what redemption is. That's what redemption is. Your sin being paid for in full. You don't owe God any more. It's been paid in full, and it was paid by the grace of Jesus on the cross. On the cross. The ransom was paid in full. And let's go on. It says, being justified freely, freely, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The ransom paid in full that is in Christ Jesus. Now, let's go to the next verse, verse 25. It says, whom God has set forth, God set forth, God made to be a propitiation. Whoa, that word propitiation. When I was a third grade teacher, we used to call them dollar words, those big words that my students were attempting to learn, endeavoring to learn. And I would say that this word propitiation, that's a dollar word, that's a big word. But you know what that word means? It means an appeasement, an appeasement. Now think about that for a minute. That word propitiation means an appeasement. Appeasement, it's satisfied. Well, who did it satisfy? says right here, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, an appeasement through faith in his blood. And who, who is being appeased? The Father, Jehovah. Notice the Father, your Father, your heavenly Father was appeased. He was appeased. He was satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that that sin that bothers you day and night, that sin that every time you try to walk with God, Satan brings up, that sin that the devil just loves to accuse you of, you can't do that because you have done this sin. 
Did you know that when the father put Jesus on the cross, it was the father's plan to get Jesus on the cross. It was the father's good pleasure to put Jesus on the cross. And what was he going to do when Jesus was on the cross? He was going to take that sin that you committed, that bothers you day and night. He took that sin and he put it on the body of Jesus. He not only put it on the body of Jesus, but it went into Jesus' soul. Jesus offered himself through that eternal spirit. And when he offered himself, God took that sin that bothers you day and night. He put it on the body and soul of Jesus. And not only that, he made sure, the Father made sure that that sin was paid for, that that sin was paid for, that that sin was paid for. The Father made sure on the cross that the iniquity of us all was put on Jesus and not only put on Jesus, but paid for. Every bone in the body of Jesus became out of joint. Why? Paying for the sin. Paying for that sin. That's what sin will do to a body. Not only that, but that soul of Jesus took that sin. I remember one day in prayer, talking back and forth with Father about the gospel. The, God, the Lord, the Father, made a remarkable statement to me. He said, Kathy, Jesus didn't carry your sins in a suitcase. They were in his heart. They became. Jesus became. The sin, it was in his soul. Did you know that Jesus died a murderer? Do you understand that Jesus died a child beater? Do you understand that Jesus paid for genocide? Do you understand that Jesus died a liar? He died an embezzler. He died a wife beater. He died with sexual immorality. He died for all of it. He died for all of it. And he died for you. Whatever you have done, he became. He died with abortion. He died with stealing. He died for all of it. He died for all of it, all of it, all sin. The iniquity of us all was laid on Jesus. So that sin that bothers you day and night, I want you to see it on the body of Jesus. I want you to see it, get it there. Get it on that body because he paid for it. He paid for it. He not only paid for it with every bone out of joint, he paid for it in hell for you. He did that for you. The Father made sure he did that. I want you to go with me to Isaiah 53. I'm going to begin in verse 10. Yet it pleased, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It made God happy that that sin that you had committed was on the body of Jesus. Did you know it made the God happy? Did you know that that sin on Jesus made God happy? Why? Because you weren't going to have to pay for it anymore. It said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
He has put him to grief. The father made Jesus sick. The father made Jesus sick. The father put that sin on Jesus. Get it there, my friends. Look at it, meditate on it. Jesus took it from you. The father put it on him and Jesus paid for it. It says, when thou shall make his soul, his soul an offering for sin, your sin went in Jesus' soul. Your sin went in Jesus' soul. Adultery went in the soul of Jesus. Murder went in the soul of Jesus. Lying, stealing, covetousness, it all went into the soul of Jesus. It says he make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Why? The next verse. The next verse. Verse 11. He shall see the travail of Jesus' soul. The Father shall see Jesus in hell paying for your sin. The Father shall see the travail of Jesus in hell paying for your sin paying for your sin the father saw him in hell paying for your sin your sin not jesus sin jesus never sinned your sin and what happened when the father saw that travail the next phrase and shall be satisfied and shall be satisfied and shall be satisfied, shall be appeased, shall be entreated, shall be satisfied. Do you see that? Look at it with your eyes if you can. The Father was satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf, and your sin was forgiven. And if you will believe, trust in, adhere to, commit to, with that blood that was shed on the cross, that sin will be justified. It'll be taken away from your conscience and you won't even remember it. Oh, there are things in my life that I have been justified from and there is no memory, no memory no conscience of that sin any longer. That is what Jesus did for you. That is how much the father loved you. He had his own son pay for it so that you could be his son too. Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want that sin totally taken away from you? Do you want to walk reconciled to the Father, where there is nothing between you and God. It is a beautiful, lovely, peaceful place to be. And how do you begin? You must be born again. You must be. Jesus said you must be born again. Pray this prayer with me so that you can be born again. Jesus hears this prayer every time it is prayed, if you pray it in sincerity. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Lead me. Teach me. Fix me. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. That is a prayer that he always hears. Amen. Amen.